Well, let me say uh, good afternoon to everyone who's joining us here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy today. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm the Associate Director for Global Engagement at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And I'm really thrilled to welcome you here today for this talk with uh, Martin Reg Cohn on the end of travel, time to revisit mass tourism. As many of you will know, of course, Martin is a political columnist with the, with the Toronto Star. He's been a foreign correspondent uh, posted abroad for more than 10 years. It's reported from more than 40 countries from Afghanistan uh, to Yemen. And now he's a columnist with the Toronto Star, really reaching across the horizon, writing on both uh, domestic affairs here in Canada and international affairs. And we're really honored that Martin, in addition to his role at the Toronto Star, is a senior fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And I just want to note uh, before we kick off that uh, the Monk School does have a great partnership with the, with the Toronto Star. We're happy to have that newspaper leading plays such an important role in Canada in our dem democratic process. And we're really happy to have this, uh, this partnership. Before I turn the stage over to Martin, I do want to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates has for thousands of years been the home of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We're lucky and privileged to work and to live and to play on this land, and we're thankful for the opportunity to do so, whether we're doing it uh, in person or whether we're gathering uh, virtually as we are today. I'm going to turn it over to Martin for this really interesting and compelling talk. Uh, Martin's going to speak. We'll have questions um, after he uh, wraps up his formal remarks. If you want to put questions, there's a Q&A function, so you can use the built-in Q&A feature to add your questions, and I'll collate them and, uh, um, and give them over to Martin. I imagine we'll have many, as we've got more than 400 of you um, in the room. So uh, you didn't come to see me. You came here to see uh, Martin Reg Cohn. So Martin, uh, thanks very much for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Peter. Uh I'd normally say great to be here, but the truth is there's not much alternative. I'm grounded, you're all grounded. There's nowhere for any of us to go right now, which makes a pandemic the perfect time to think about travel and to rethink tourism. We're all living through what I call the unbearable lightness of, or the unbearable, mixing up the titles there, the unbearable remoteness of being. So there's no better time to take you on this journey, a journalistic journey with some academic detours along the way, using images and research for my travels as a foreign correspondent. Now, like any journey, a PowerPoint slide deck can be a bumpy ride, especially with me at the controls. So let me try to make this work. Uh, if I screw up, uh, Monk has a SWAT team ready to rescue me. So let me try to make this engage and share. And let's see if that is working. I just have to now put this in slide screen mode. Let's see if I've been well trained. There we go. And we need to go to the beginning of the slide. There we go. Everyone can see that. See, if we were live, you'd be able to say speak louder or can't see anything. But uh, as I say, Monk will save me if, if need be. OK, so if I screw up on the pictures, forgive me. We'll just go with the flow and enjoy the show until the words and images uh, are back in sync. Uh, and the title of today's talk, as you know, is The End of Travel, uh, Time to Revisit Mass Tourism. So it's a play on words. It's riffing off the end of history, of course, by Francis Fukuyama. His book was wrong, of course, because history did not stand still. And the same is true of travel. It will not stand still uh, when COVID is behind us. Mass tourism will rise again from the dead for better or for worse. So the question is how to do it differently and less destructively after the mass destruction of COVID. So let's think of this as a thought experiment. This talk is really uh, about trying to reinvent travel. In fact, we're already living through uh, a real life experiment right now, a once in a lifetime experiment because COVID has killed almost all travel. Have a look at this slide. It's sourced from the UN's World Tourism Organization. And you can see how tourism went up astronomically over the years from about 400 million uh, in 1990, all the way up to to 1.4 billion in 2020, just before the pandemic. A staggering increase, and then it went off the cliff. You can see the delta that I've marked out for you, down by 1.1 billion tourists over the pandemic. Uh, a real roller coaster ride, up a billion, down a billion. Here's another slide. I promise there won't be too many. I'm just trying to be fancy here. Uh, but you can see on the right of that screen uh, in the Asia Pacific region, tourism went down 82% and, and worldwide about 72% because today 
we're almost all grounded and that is a drag. But the truth is that mass tourism was already a drag, a drag on everybody and on everything, a drag on the environment, a drag on water resources, a drag on people jostling with too many people. And if you're surrounded by your fellow travelers who come from the same place and are all going to the same place, you have to ask, why travel to the far ends of the earth only to feel like you never left home? So we tend to go back and forth between the fantasies and realities of travel, the aspirations we all have, the frustrations we encounter. My argument today is that post-pandemic, we need a new way to visit ancient relics and living cultures without over-touristing them. Otherwise, we will be crowding ourselves out and shortchanging ourselves. So our task is to find a better way. And I'm going to lead you on a journey, show you how we got here and where we go from here. I'll show you not only the destinations, but also the origins of mass tourism. Bit of a history lesson. What do I mean by that? After visiting so many UNESCO heritage sites around the world, I was cheating. I'd always build some time into my itineraries. After interviewing so many uh, tourism ministers, I went straight to the source. I went to the world headquarters of the Lonely Planet Publishing Empire to visit and interview the founders of the world's biggest travel guidebook operation, Ground Zero for Guidebooks. And I'll tell you what I learned about the romance and the mystery of foreign travel, but also the misery of mass tourism or monster tourism, as I like to call it. Um, I'll talk about the problems. You'll hear a lot of them. I'll try to find some of the solutions as well. So don't give up as you hear me talk everything down. Talk about what works and what doesn't work. Think about it. Let's look at this slide for a second. If you deconstruct travel and this image, uh, if you look at the academic theory, but also the practical reality, there's a lot to analyze. The economics, you have the exchange, currency exchange stuff on that in that photo. There's the economics, the sociology, the anthropology. It's about currency exchange, but also cultural exchange. It's about exploration, but also sometimes exploitation of remote areas. So after I tackle some of those questions, as Peter said, I'll turn to your questions and please start thinking them up now as we begin the journey. So you heard my bio, I, my day job is I'm a political columnist for the Toronto Star, Canada's biggest and best daily newspaper. I'm a senior fellow here at Monk. I am a visiting practitioner at the Ryerson's Faculty of Arts. I had a fellowship from the Asia Pacific Foundation to spend time in Indonesia studying Islam in the world's biggest Islamic country. But deep down, I am a recovering foreign correspondent. I spent four years in Jerusalem running the Star's Middle East Bureau, covering conflicts from Algeria all the way to Yemen and Iran. I covered the peace negotiations, but as soon as I left, I have to tell you, the Middle East fell apart four years later. So uh, they sent me to Hong Kong, where I uh, ran the Asia Bureau for another seven years. Hong Kong was a peaceful place. We know that's no longer the case after I left. Roaming from Afghanistan to North Korea and everywhere in between, China, India, et cetera. And, you know, being a foreign correspondent, I'm going to show off a bit. It means you get paid to have fun and your job pays your way around the world. It's double happiness. I got to travel high and low, but I could also claim to have a higher purpose because I was doing God's work as a journalist, at least in my own mind. But after 11 years on the road, imagine that 11 years, I needed a break because you can have too much of a good thing, but also too much of bad things. I was covering acts of God, tsunamis and earthquakes that could crush your spirit. Uh, but I was also covering, really depressingly, the man-made disasters, the acts of war that could drive you to God, the bombings, the terrorist attacks, the massacres, journalists getting kidnapped, Danny Pearl killed. You know, my two little girls were about to turn two, and so it was time to come home before something bad happened to me while I was having so much fun. And the truth is though, I was tired of traveling and it was time to come in from the cold. So now I'm a colonist, which is the second best job in journalism after foreign reporting. And I have, well, when I came home, I put away my luggage, I put it in storage. Now let's just say I was weighed down by a lot of baggage after all those years of travel and living out of a suitcase. When you're a road warrior, your luggage is your life as some of you would know. So let me try to unpack what happened to me then and what's happening to all of us now. At the time, uh, as a reaction to that travel, I did something that shocked my fellow journalists, especially the foreign reporters. I let my passports expire. In fact, I had two Canadian passports. I'm showing off here again because I had a, a second one for travel around Israel. 
uh, but uh, I can't talk about that, that's top secret. Um, but without even a single passport, I couldn't leave the country, which was fine with me because I had sworn off foreign travel. It was tourism detox. I became foreign editor, I wrote a foreign column, but I stopped applying for visas to all those far off countries that had been my meal ticket for 11 years. And I didn't even look at my fancy pants passport stamps anymore, although I do now. So, you know, North Korea, Pakistan, Afghanistan, I kind of thumbed through the pages, been there, done that, but I was done with it. Um, I even wrote an article about the end of travel uh, many years ago in which I publicly swore off travel. I put it in print that I was grounded at my own request. Uh, I didn't miss it, not one bit, not one trip, I was done. And then surprise, uh, I started missing it again. I had, I had recovered from the overdose and I started craving another fix of foreign travel, just like many of you here today, I suspect. So why is that? Do the anthropologists have the answer or the neuroscientists? Are we hardwired to travel? Is it in our DNA? Are we still nomads and migrants? I mean, I'm the child of immigrants, so is, is it in my blood? Uh, my explanation is simpler. Think of how we're feeling now in the pandemic. Everyone talks about Groundhog Day because everyone, well, every day feels the same, day after day and the day after that. Okay, that's not a groundhog in the picture, but uh, I could only find a chipmunk at this rented cottage I was at to pose on my copy of the book in front of you, Sapiens, by the anthropologist Yuval Noah Harari. And here's what he says about the impulse to travel, quote, to break free from our daily routine, leave behind our familiar setting and go traveling in distant lands where we can, quote, experience the culture, unquote. He goes on to say that the tourism industry does not sell flight tickets and hotel rooms, it sells experiences, unquote. Very important. By the way, uh, here's the groundhog. When I settled into the job of foreign editor back home and then writing this column uh, three times a week, the political column that I write now, I noticed that everything became a blur. The columns were a blur. I couldn't remember last week's column. And yet I had a clear image in my brain about the days that I had spent visiting these villages in Nepal or these sleeping in monasteries in Tibet because our brains are visual, right? I could visualize every place I had been and the people I had met, but not the politicians I'd interviewed the day before or the week before. So I wanted to travel again and get my memory working again. And then one day in 2017, the New York Times contacted me. Their foreign editor knew me from our time together. Uh, I'm not gonna name drop him, but we were together as foreign correspondents and he recommended me to their travel division, which is called New York Times Journeys. Who knew? I'd, I'd never heard of it. And they organize these amazing trips for people to exotic places accompanied by a journalist. And they give us this fancy title, New York Times Expert. Love that. Uh, local guides do actually, actually do all the heavy lifting and the experts are just there to give lectures in the evenings or during a midday cruise about the country that we're visiting, Middle East peace process. And I also gave a version of the talk you're hearing today about what it's like to be a foreign correspondent. You don't have to hear that, but about tourism. And then we would tag along daytime offering a little pearls of wisdom, great gig, very expensive, very exclusive. Uh, and I lectured by night, but by day I could, these are just, let me just, Fast forward, by the way, you can see the trip cost like about 10,000 Canadian plus your airfare per person. So it could really add up. Uh, and by day I could, uh, I, and this is our charter jet flying from Luxor to Cairo. I brought my, they let me bring my daughter along, Halle. Uh, but by day I could, uh, I could snap photos and I have not have to file stories afterwards. By day I could uh, watch the tourists in action and I, and I would you know, compare notes with the travel agency that actually did the heavy lifting under the New York Times cover. It was Abercrombie and Kent. And I got a bit of an insider's view of how the business works. I led trips to Iran and Lebanon, Jordan, a couple of trips to Egypt. Uh, and I guess say I got to play tourist. The trips were never a sure thing, by the way, because they like to go to fun places. And sometimes uh, these difficult destinations could be tricky. We had booked a whole trip to Kashmir that they had advertised and it got suspended because a shooting war broke out between India and Pakistan. And then more trips got canceled. I was booked for trips to Iran and they were canceled when Donald Trump uh, imposed sanctions on Tehran, then Lebanon blew up and that got canceled. And then COVID-19 came along and the whole enterprise has been put on ice. So that's bad news for me, good news for you because I'm sharing my New York Times lecture on the end of travel and it's a lot less expensive today. So there's a good reason that tourists wanted to team up with journalists for those trips. They wanted a different kind of trip for their money, lots of money. But journalists and tourists live in different worlds and see the world differently. Tourists 
understandably run away from danger. For journalists, it's part of the job description to rush directly into danger. Uh, but sometimes it's dangerous for both of us, uh, both tourists and journalists. And the threat comes not from mass tourism, but terrorism. And the guests on my trips were worried. They knew about Americans being taken hostage in Iran, of course, uh, in Lebanon, tourists being taken and killed in Egypt. And I had to explain to them how, to, how I covered this catastrophic attack in Luxor where 62 people were killed uh, along the Nile back in the late 1990s. And this is when I was there at the time, the place was deserted. Um, when I arrived, there was just dead pharaohs, dead tourists, dead police. That's me and a colleague uh, looking around after it happened. And I had this realization, this awkward recognition that to avoid the perils of mass tourism, you should visit right after the terrorism. It's a bit morbid, but it works. I took my wife back to Egypt just a few weeks after the attacks because if we could, if I could cover these dangerous places on the job, why couldn't I do it off duty? And, and so we went, two of us had it to ourselves, uh, half the tourists, half the price. More seriously though, I, I tried to explain to my fellow travelers on those trips, my, my own philosophy about danger for foreign correspondents and tourists. Danger is about being in the wrong place. Uh, is, sorry, it's about being in the wrong place but, and at the wrong time. Uh, the way to uh, stay out of danger to avoid is to avoid the double jeopardy of wrong place and wrong time. Okay, just mix it up. My survival strategy was to go to dangerous places well ahead of the danger or long after the danger. Let me give you a couple of quick case, case studies about this. First, Yemen and then Kashmir. You're looking at Yemen here. Uh, sometimes it is actually more dangerous for tourists than journalists because in Yemen, before the civil war that's been going on for the last few years, I traveled into the desert to visit a local tribe that had been kidnapping foreign tourists to ransom the government. And you might ask, why would I go to meet these kidnappers of my own free will? And the answer is that I was younger and dumber. I had no kids yet. Uh, but the truth is that I was also confident in the power of Islam, not Islamic fundamentalism or whatever you want to call it, political Islam, but the power of Islamic hospitality that is bestowed on visitors. I was their honored honored guest, and so they had to protect me. They showed us their weapons, uh, but the only bloodshed was when they slaughtered a goat in our honor for uh, an interview and a feast. So it was like a free lunch, uh, which journalists like. We were fed and watered, and then we could take our leave, unlike the tourists who had been kept for weeks. So let me tell you a little bit about other countries where tourists also stopped going. I want you to talk, uh, see, um, this is Kashmir. And you know, in a lot of these countries, tourists were terrified uh, of the terrorism, the militarism, the soldiers everywhere, and the politicians in these police states or police areas were often terrified of journalists. So often the only person who would talk to me was the tourism minister whose job was to put on a happy face. So I tried that in Kashmir, in Algeria, Tunisia, Syria, Yemen. I would ask to interview the tourism minister as a cover to talk politics. So I learned a little bit along the way here and Kashmir was the most memorable. Um, the minister insisted there was nothing to fear, but when I got to her house, this is her house, surrounded by a lot of very nervous bodyguards in her own home. Uh, and when I met her boss, the chief minister of Kashmir, he asked him to join him on a campaign swing. And these were the bodyguards right beside us, following us on, on the boats. Uh, and I was truly terrified because uh, I realized he was a big target, but I was a sitting duck sitting down right beside him. So. More seriously, the tourism infrastructure in Kashmir was actually quite extensive because it is a beautiful place and it was a traditional honeymoon destination for Indians and, and foreigners. Uh, but the problem was uh, so much to see and no tourists to be seen. The houseboats had nobody except for housekeepers and the palatial hotels, which were actually former palaces, in fact, were empty. Uh, they were empty when I visited and they are still empty today. So the bottom line is that terrorism isn't just deadly for people. Terrorism will kill tourism and it will empty out the best hotels very fast. But here's the important point. The lesson is that it depends on when you check in and when you check out. Danger depends on time and place. It's about timing, not location. Uh, I'm going to develop that point as for broader international ter terrorism, sorry, tourism. But in the meantime, while I'm talking about it, I, this is just, I, because I'm so morbid, this is a collection I put together. These are all hotels I've stayed at in Afghanistan. Now this is in Bombay, Mumbai, that blew up after I was there or before I was there, Jakarta and so on. Um, I kept track of them all. Um, and, and 
uh, the point is, though, that even though these places look scary, there's no guarantee of safety here in Toronto when a gunman shoots up the Danforth or somebody attacks people on Young Street or bombs go off at the Boston Marathon. This is in Islamabad. This is now in Pakistan. Uh, when a mob attacks Capitol Hill, every place is dangerous. And in a pandemic, uh, no hotel in the world is safe, right? This is, by the way, an update to my slides. This is from Quetta in Pakistan, the Serena Hotel, which I stayed out on my way to Afghanistan. This just happened last week, so I updated it. Uh, the collection never stays static. The point, though, is that danger can strike anywhere at any time, not just in these far off places. And the problem is that if you have an exaggerated fear of danger, it distorts our travel plans and our tourist patterns because it drives everyone away from the supposedly scary places like the Middle East to the same old supposedly safe places like Paris or Madrid that are very much on the beaten path, but there's no shortage of bombs in London or Madrid or Paris. It happens rather often. And whenever I stopped over on my way to Algeria, North Africa, whenever I would stop over in Rome or Athens, I was stunned by the crowds. Uh, it was culture shock, a tourist invasion, almost as terrifying as a terrorist attack because I had lull been lulled into the sense of, wow, uh, it was such a contrast to the empty Roman ruins. Uh, oh, by the way, that's in the Philippines. Sorry, I fell out of sync there. That's when the, there was a coup attempt and they brought tanks into the hotel lobby at the peninsula where I'd go to lunch. Uh, so strange scene. Back to the Roman ruins of, in this case, southern Lebanon. My colleague uh, from the LA Times and I had the place all to ourselves. More slides to come. You'll see of, uh, uh, this is my wife uh, has uh, the ruins of Hatra uh, to herself in Northern Iraq. This by the way is in Jerash uh, in Jordan, just in the last two years of those New York Times trips. There's no tourists there, just the New York Times folks. So the point is I couldn't cope with the crowds that I would see at the Acropolis, which is in front of you now, where the swarms of tourists made it look more like an anthill than a Greek temple. Same problem in Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Uh, everyone converges on the ruins. It's a UNESCO site, but it looks like an anthill when you actually get there. And I, that just drove me crazy. Now, it wasn't just the swarms of people. It was the massive infrastructure that supported all those people. I wrote a lot about the destructive impact of mass tourism which would lead to the bulldozing and demolition of traditional markets and structures to make way for new tourist hotels and huge restaurants and oversized parking lots. So let's just talk a bit about the rise and decline of mass tourism or monster tourism. Um, this is, sorry, this is a story I wrote about in uh, uh, Laos uh, about the problems of uh, people invading Cambodia. So you can see here in 1990, there were 400 million tourists. In the year 2000, almost doubled to 700 million tourists. And in the last two decades, from the year 2000 until 2018, 1.4 billion tourists, it has doubled. Okay, so the trajectory is astonishing. Um, now, as you know, it went off the cliff, as you saw on that earlier slide, uh, for the pandemic, but the projections are still for tourism to reach close to 2 billion people within the next decade, and roughly half of it coming from China. Now, it's also, um, most people go to France, as you can see here, I'm gonna skip through that. Here's an interesting statistic though. Uh, this chart is hard to read, but basically on a per capita basis, uh, people from Britain are among the world's most eager travelers and Canadians are actually right up there, whereas uh, Americans and others are rather down the list. Now, just to understand tourism, put it in perspective, it is the biggest employer on the planet, 330 million jobs, that's one in 10 jobs, $9 trillion in economic activity, 10% of global GDP. It is the world's biggest growth industry. And now let's talk about what's driving that growth, which is the rise of Chinese mass tourism. The Chinese are late to the party, but they are joining the crowd and they are adding to the overcrowding because today's China is dramatically different from when I first visited. You can compare some of the before and after photos. Uh, before I do, I'm just gonna break this up a little bit, make sure you're all still paying attention. This is a little, uh, this is me. Uh, by the way, the last photo was just, you, you can't even see her, she's a spec. That's my wife has the Great Wall altar herself, me on an earlier trip, empty behind me. This is a little fun diversion for five seconds here. My wife and, and, and me on the Great Wall, 
Uh, if you can figure this out, you're a genius, but no, she's not defying gravity. It's not Photoshop. All we did was turn the photo on its axis. This is what it really looks like. She's standing straight on the steep, very steep great wall. And I'm the one who's leaning, looking casual uh, on, against the great wall, just to keep you awake. This is what the great wall looks like today, not an optical illusion. And you can see, let me catch up here, that, um, well, I'm gonna tell you that in the year 2000, only 10 million overseas trips were made by Chinese residents by, oh, I'm ahead of my slide here. Let me just catch up. Here's the important point. Yeah, that's right, I was on track here. I uh, just didn't have that number 10 million. By the year 2010, there were uh, 60 million outbound trips. And uh, before the pandemic, it was 150 million trips. So it had doubled in a decade, outbound tourism. And China is now the biggest source of outbound tourists in the world today. And even though it's 150 million foreign trips for them, domestic travel is 5.5 billion trips for the Chinese, okay? And they are, um, there's the chart I wanted to show you, sorry, up to 150 million. Uh, they are by far the biggest spenders too, roughly double what Americans spend. And they, they spend almost a hundred times what Canadians spend. So uh, think about that. Okay. Um, you may have heard of Golden Week in China. There are 800 million domestic trips in a week in China compared to about 30 million a week when I first got to Hong Kong a couple of decades ago. So what does that look like and feel like? Historically, the Chinese um, are inveterate travelers and wanderers. And today, they may also just want to get away from their own tourist sites, which are so overcrowded and sometimes very crassly reconstructed. Uh, in Yunnan province, I wrote about the remote village of Lijiang. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site that is considered the inspiration for Shangri-La. But now it feels sometimes like paradise lost because the Chinese have torn down authentic homes in nearby villages to make way for new shopping malls which are owned and operated by outsiders. And across China, ancient temples are being suffocated by the modern commercial sprawl. Historic neighborhoods are demolished to be replaced by swank new restaurants. And so what you see as a arriving tourist is often reconstructed, it's an optical illusion, which is too bad because we fantasize about going to a religious sanctuary or a sumptuous palace or an isolated village where we can be alone with our thoughts. And the problem is when paradise isn't so pretty anymore and a temple feels more like a playground for tour groups rather than a revered place of worship. And as tourism infiltrates the far corners of the globe, the travel juggernaut seems unstoppable and increasingly unmemorable. I mean, why trek to an exotic locale if it is so westernized and touristed as to feel eerily familiar? So what's the alternative? How do we get away from the monster that we created? I'm gonna to try to explore that for the rest of the talk. One solution is to use our own mental filters to zoom in for a close up uh, or crop out the distractions that obscure your photo. So you get that idyllic image uh, and get rid of the crowds that are crowding out your photograph. An old friend and a China hand, a New York Times reporter in Shanghai, one said that to truly appreciate the country's magnificently flawed heritage, you need to see it through a zoom lens. And only by zooming in and screening out the encroaching ugliness can you enjoy what's left of the middle kingdom because it's getting hard to see past the distractions. So let me show you how I've zoomed in and cropped out to create uh, or to cope with my own aversion to crowds and commerce and cops. Because here you can see the security forces that are actually right in front of the Potala Palace not a pretty picture. There's even a MiG jet, an old jet parked right in front of the Fotala Palace, which used to be the residence of the Dalai Lama before he fled uh, Tibet in 1959. Uh, you can see here a Tibetan pilgrim making a spiritual pilgrimage to the palace. And right in front of him, there's this little speck, which I'm gonna zoom in on. And there is a, a, a little uh, corrugated metal outpost for the post office, uh, which is kind of dispiriting if you are a spiritual tourist and, and, and the post office is trying to put its own stamp literally on and figuratively speaking on the palace. Um, now, the biggest source of tourism in Tibet today is from Chinese tourists. Uh, there's a high-speed train that brings them across the Tibetan plateau 
the tour guides are mostly Chinese because they speak the same language and they know the script. And what's true in China is true everywhere. So here's a few more examples of the magic of cropping or timing to see what you wanna see and forget what you don't wanna remember. But you can't pretend it's not there and that it's not getting worse. So now when I go to the pyramids or to Petra, it's more crowded than ever. Look at these slides, uh, cropping or zooming out is one solution. Here's my two girls at Petra. You go at the closing time to get rid of the crowds, but this is what it looks like at high noon and most of the time. And so it's a little uh, off-putting, but this is us. It's not just, this is not, no, we are they. And this is, uh, this is us, this is us right now looking at these folks, looking at Petra. And so it gets kind of crowded. Um, let's see what else. This is me in, in Abu Simbel years ago when there almost nobody there. This is my daughter when I took her on that New York Times trip, my other daughter, Yasmin. Uh, but all I did here was crop because if you zoom out, this is, you can see the crowds everywhere, uh, which bother me. So hence I crop. And this is what it tends to look like as the day goes on. So um, that's not really going to help us. Cropping only goes so far. Uh, is there a more serious and sustainable way? By the way, sorry, this is the pyramids. Again, my daughter has the pyramids all to herself. Uh, but this is what it's like at the front entrance for Yasmin, surrounded by people in every direction. So um, is there a more serious and sustainable way to get away from the madness of monster tourism? And my answer is that if we want to understand uh, the end of travel, we have to go back to the beginning of travel uh, or the world before mass tourism, before it went off course. And when I traveled to China uh, back in the early 1980s as a kid uh, or a cub reporter, I guess, foreign tourists had just been allowed into the People's Republic for the first time, uncharted territory. And everyone was carrying this new, brand new guidebook uh, called China Off the Beaten Path. And we all laughed about it because we kept bumping into each other with the book in our backpacks, all sticking to the same route, singing from the same songbook and reading from the same guidebook. Yes. Now that's the paradox of travel. If everyone is trekking on that same trail, it will inevitably be overrun and it will feel like we're just running in place. If you're surrounded by fellow travelers who are dressed like you or backpacking like you and shopping like you and taking pictures like you, you won't feel any place special or foreign. And if there's no locals left in the cafes or the restaurants or the shops or the churches of the inner city, if it's just tourists and souvenir shops like you sitting in a Disney theme park, then you've gone a long way to not get very far. Okay, so this brings me to the question of how do you find your way? And the answer is that whether you're on the beaten path, path as a tourist or off the beaten path as a journalist, you need a navigator or else you're flying blind. Uh, so on those New York Times tours, um, I wasn't their official tour guide, but I was acting as their eyes and ears because I'd been to those destinations many times before. So how did I find my way the first time? How did foreign correspondents know where to go and who to talk to? After all, we're foreigners too. The dirty little secret of being a foreign correspondent in a faraway and unfamiliar place is that you cannot do it on your own, or you'd be lost, blinded by your own ignorance, prejudices, we'd say privilege today, culture shock. The solution is to cheat by teaming up with people who know better and can see what we can't see. And these are local journalists or other people who work as fixers. You've heard about this. Their fixers are not just translators, they are true interpreters. They're not just bilingual, but they're bicultural and they bridge the perception gap. And that's what I relied on everywhere I went. And I think that's why the New York Times dreamed up this idea of pairing up journalists with tourists on their journey so we could offer some insight. But if you can't afford a fancy trip like that, the chances are you'll go looking for another kind of guided tour and eventually you will turn to a guidebook or perhaps an online advisor like uh, a guide like tripadvisor.com. Um, so I wanted to understand how people were finding their way and who was telling them where to go. I was fascinated by the power of these guidebooks by these gurus, almost like the Wizard of Oz behind a curtain. Uh, so I decided to go to the source to see the wizardry in Oz, in fact, more precisely in Australia. And I flew to Melbourne, the home of the Lonely Planet Publishing Empire, the nerve center of the world's travel boom. So I could see the collected works of the Brain Trust run by Tony Wheeler and his wife, Maureen. And in their renovated warehouse, uh, lined with uh, where they were linked up with hundreds of their travel writers around the world, 
they had reinvented the guidebook genre and reshaped the world of travel for both backpackers and jet setters alike, rich and poor. It started in the 1970s uh, with their first guidebook, Southeast Asia on a shoestring, classic title. They grew to a library of 800 volumes you can see behind you, behind him, I should say, becoming the dominant guidebook of our time, selling 6 million copies, more than 6 million, $100 million a year in revenues. But success provoked second thoughts for Tony Wheeler. He worried about the limits to growth and the fallout from the travel boom that he had helped to create. Because guidebooks encouraged this herd instinct with tourists slavishly following the same congested itineraries in the latest editions of his books. We are all on the beaten track, quote unquote, he told me. No surprise there. But what's the answer from him, from the backpacker who now flies business class and whose business is telling people how to fan out to every corner of the planet? How do you save us from tourism? I'd flown all the way to Australia, to Oz, to find out what this wizard would say. And I had burned a lot of carbon and it turned out to be a dead end because he said, I don't have the answer. Okay, I said, so if you can't give me any guidance, at least tell me which guidebook you recommend for people. And I kind of knew the answer when I asked the question. The answer, of course, was Iran. He told me what I already knew, that part of the reason, I'm quoting here, part of the reason it's so wonderful is because there are no tourists. Almost nobody goes to Iran. Uh, so you can, you can pretty much have it all to yourself. And you can see for yourself in, in some of these slides. Uh, but let's try to put Iran in perspective, not just in terms of safety. It's not as dangerous as it sounds, all these down with USA signs and these posters here. I mean, this is in Isfahan in the main square, like our Nathan Phillips Square, a lot more mosques. But uh, you see these menaces, you can't really perhaps see the details, but at the bottom are these bad images of America, Israel, and uh, the UK, uh, the great Satan, the little Satan, the sly fox. But right around from these women are these other guys, kids, um, women having, taking selfies and pictures and uh, showing a little bit of hair, lowering their hijab for the photo but while they can get away with it. Um, so the truth is, uh, it's, it's an opportunity opportunity, not just a question of safety. And everywhere that I went in Iran over the years, I saw what I'm going to call elite tourists, by which I mean very smart, very savvy travelers. And they usually came from three European countries, Italy, France, and Germany. And I would see these Europeans in places where no one else would go, a little jumping the gun there on that slide, forgive me, so you don't have to look at me. But they were uh, not just in Iran, but also in Yemen, uh, until the kidnappers scared them off. Also in Syria, before the civil war, where almost nobody went. Uh, and this is me in Palmyra in Syria and them. They were the only other people in the hotel. Unfortunately, this hotel, which is right on the grounds of, the, of Palmyra, um, which got blown up by ISIS, Daesh, uh, just a few years ago. And so now it's too dangerous uh, even for any of us. But it's still true in Lebanon. I went back to Beirut, as I mentioned, a couple of years ago. This is in... Um, Baalbek, uh, and we had this incredible Roman ruins all to ourselves, uh, except for those fearless French and Italian and German tourists. So the Europeans have figured out how to get away from over tourism. And their, their secret is to focus on failed states or faltering countries that are the forbidden fruit of travel. And in these countries like Iran, uh, it is possible to imagine a world before mass tourism because it feels almost like pre-tourism. I couldn't help noticing that, that the people who are suffering, sadly, from economic hardship, who had yet to taste the fruits or frustrations of mass tourism, were the most friendly toward foreigners because they didn't see dollar signs stamped on our foreheads. And people, by the way, if it's your wedding day, you don't have to wear the hijab, you can wear the, 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 the crown tiara. Uh, people in these remote countries had yet to sour on us. They had yet to weary of bargain hunting backpackers or deep discount tour groups. Baghdad, Tehran, Westerners are, aware, are a rarity. And so people are eager to strike up conversations to practice their English. And they're not scamming you. There's no quote quid pro quo. Uh, it's not like if you're going to, I don't know, some other busy place like Cairo, for example. But there can be a power imbalance between the visitors and the visited in some of these remote places, the hunters and the hunted, because as people search for ever more remote destinations to get away from the crowds, it creates new tensions and contradictions. You know, by visiting a, uh, an unspoiled place, do you spoil it for others, the others who live there and the others who come after you, 
the tidal wave of tourism has a way of engulfing the most tranquil waters. Because sometimes what seems undeveloped uh, uh, is and seems is, is, is sometimes what seems unspoiled is actually just undeveloped. And rural poverty can appear pastoral, backwardness is quaint, but what passes as cultural tourism can sometimes be cultural voyeurism. Now, my theory is that the Europeans went to the far ends of the earth to find places without tourism because they were running away from mass tourism at home. It was a kind of escape from tourism. It wasn't, it wasn't counter-terrorism, it was counter-tourism. And maybe that's why so many Chinese tourists now leapfrog ahead of their own domestic tourists in search of seemingly unspoiled destinations across Southeast Asia. And that's what we're seeing now in Myanmar. The largest share of its tourists comes from China. It's doubled in the last few years to three quarters of a million just to one country. And I don't wanna pick on Chinese tourists, uh, but let's just say that it has caused culture shock for Myanmar, a country that was almost completely isolated for decades. When we used to call it Burma, by the way. If you put a lot of people from any country in a big group, sometimes it's a language barrier, you get group psychology and bad behavior. And the people who are most upset about misbehaving Chinese is of course the Chinese themselves. They're embarrassed. And here's what President Xi Jinping, who I don't normally quote, but here's what he instructed a few years ago in a public declaration. He said, quote, we should educate our citizens to be civilized when traveling abroad. Don't litter water bottles. Don't destroy their coral reef. Eat instant noodles and more local seafood, unquote. His words, not mine. And a few years ago, the Chinese government actually published an illustrated guidebook on civilized tourism, which demanded that travelers respect local customs. And the caption on this slide speaks for itself. It says, quote, don't spit phlegm or gum, throw litter, urinate or defecate wherever you like. Don't cough, sneeze, or pick your nose or teeth in front of others. Part of the 65 pages in this guidebook. Uh, one more quote, it says, don't take a long time using public toilets, unquote. Now that's a universal adage. It could apply to everybody, but you get the idea. The problem in Burma is that the big payoff from Chinese tourism is coming up empty because of what's called zero dollar tourism. Zero dollar tourism. It's when everyone comes on a prepaid package tour with all the cash flow flowing to the Chinese owned stores, hotels, restaurants, and souvenir shops that are all tied together, cutting out the local tour guides and locally owned hotels because it's a Chinese tour guide showing them the way. Now, You've heard a lot about the negative impact of tourism. So let's talk about the positive for, for a few minutes. Um, I'm gonna offer some case studies, starting with Myanmar again. But as you know, the country has been tormented by military misrule for decades on and off and now on again with the latest military coup. A few years ago, when she was still in opposition, Myanmar's most famous democracy leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, now a little more notorious, called for a travel boycott. And when she was released from house arrest back then, I slipped into the country on a tourist visa, happily, couldn't get a press visa, so that I could interview her. And we talked about her boycott idea. And her argument was that the major hotels were owned by the military who made all the money. Fair point. I always wondered about her idea, but in, in my experience, the people of Myanmar were desperate, not just for foreign funds, whatever cut they could get, but foreign contact and foreign friendship. I'm gonna slip, go quickly through these slides, but you know, here's a, some stand-up comics that I uh, interviewed who were banned from performing for local audiences, but the only paying customers that they could get was foreigners. So they, at least there was a bit of a lifeline for a few years and they had, had to translate all the punchlines, hence the signs in the background. A, a family in Shan State that I interviewed that, that had a Massey Ferguson tractor that the military had confiscated and they finally got it back. And so they asked by word of mouth for back backpackers and tourists to bring them the parts and he was able to rebuild it. And they also brought magazines and they said, look, you know, all we have, quote, all we have is what we get from backpackers and visitors. They are our lifeline. Uh, I am going to run out of time, so I'm not going to tell you my favorite story about the so-called Jumping Cats Monastery in Burma, where I stayed behind on my own steam after the tourists had left and talked to the monks and uh, learned the cat trick, but also learned about uh, some of the political secrets uh, at the time. Uh, I can't share either of them with you. Um, he, the monk is dead, has passed away, I'm sad to say. Uh, the jumping cats are all dead, so they don't jump anymore. We can, I can tell you how in the Q&A later, but my point is that travel boycotts to Burma or anywhere else are a complicated question. I'll let you look at that for a second. Um, 
because, you know, the New York Times came under a lot of pressure to cancel its Iran trips when Trump was stirring things up. Uh, but I, I'd encourage you to, if, if you're interested, let's talk about that. Let's park that for the Q&A, circle back later. The lesson, though, is that tourism can, in fact, be symbiotic, obviously, nourishing for both sides. And you've heard me talk a lot about the downside. So let's talk about the upside. Uh, let's look at some of the ways that you can stay away from the masses with a different kind of tourism. Let's call them market segments or niches or boutique tourism. They're all fancy words, but anything that's an alternative to monster tourism on a more human scale. Um, here's some chapter headings to think about. First up, cultural tourism, which is top of the list. Uh, most of us would probably say that's why we travel. We're curious about our fellow humans and their history. I stayed this, at this monastery as a tourist because I couldn't get a press visa for about uh, two or three nights and it was unbelievable, uh, even though it's complicated. Um, what did I die lose my spot from here? Um, there we go. There's also educational tourism, next, next chapter heading. The New York Times Journeys tries to do that. People like me delivering educational lectures. And in this case, we were doing a, uh, a town hall on a university campus uh, just outside Beirut, Notre Dame University with the students. I brought the tourists also to see a local newsroom, also in Cairo. So the trip was almost a little bit journalistic, not just touristic, which I think people enjoyed. And a lot of museums do this, the Smithsonian, there's academic travel, National Geographic has these kind of educational tours. Then there's ecotourism, the most virtuous of voyages, thanks to the power of modern marketing where it's possible to persuade tourists that their eco trip on a jet plane will improve planetary understanding while preserving the planet's environment while overflying the polluted parts. The problem is that a typical intercontinental flight produces two tons of carbon dioxide per passenger each way, which is roughly the output of driving your car for a full year, just one trip one way. A mid-sized cruise ship with 3,000 passengers uses 150 tons of fuel a day, which is equivalent to about a million cars in terms of particulates. So there's not much ecotourism by boat or plane. And if you take one of those round of the world air charters at the Times does, you're really pushing the envelope into the stratosphere. Uh, you know, carbon credits might get you into heaven one day, but they will not reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the reality is that a visiting ecotourist consumes more water in a week than a villager drinks in a year. So you're draining the local water table while you're dance, dining at a fancy restaurant table. Let's look at Kerala. This is uh, in the south of India. It's a spectacular tourist destination, famous for its backwater road boat trips. And the tourist uh, ads call it God's country. And I took my family there, uh, my little daughter, Hallie, uh, for a final assignment. And here we are enjoying this beautiful houseboat uh, with a room, with a view, beautiful view, but off the tourist trail, it doesn't look so pretty. Different boat, this one provided, uh, I was helped out by an NGO, environmental NGO, and it's a different kind of reality ecotourism, not one I think people would wanna pay for, but that's the problem, that's the flip side. Now, quick back to my chapter headings, a close cousin of ecotourism is adventure tourism, advent tourism, depending on how you pronounce it, back to nature, back to the mountains, hiking, trekking, my wife and me in Borneo, uh, Nepal is a huge destination for adventurism and not just for Mount Everest. The problem is that too many people are all on that beaten track on the trail and camping has capacity limits as we know here with our national parks. As a colleague from the Wall Street Journal once said if in, in Nepal or once wrote in Nepal you can see the trails of purple toilet paper on the trails or as you can see here water bottles piling up. And there's wildlife tourism and ecotourism are close, close cousins. I've done it and it's great and it's not that crowded. It is expensive. Uh, happy when the star pays for me. Uh, but when you're dealing with, with animals, well, here we are, sorry, here's the slides. This is in Borneo again with the orangutans uh, in Bali, in fact. Uh, this is a weird one in, in Sichuan, China at the very famous uh, Wulong Panda Sanctuary, but these tourists <laughs> paid off the, guy, the, the local keeper or groundskeeper, animal keeper, and we're able to get in and pose for photo ops with a panda, a little strange. Okay, back to chapter heading, voluntourism, very big now. Uh, think of the charities that try to save the world's poor by bringing affluent white teenagers to show them how to build schools by bringing bags of money. Uh, because for some reason, people think that the locals cannot do it on their own. They need high school kids from Toronto to, to show them how to do it. And we've all heard of the controversy of the Kilberger brothers with their WE charity. Uh, as you can see in this photo, which is why I took it, 
the locals are not entirely helpless unless you make them feel that way with a savior complex. Then there's culinary tourism, very big. As you can see, it's going to go up by go up to about $1.8 billion in just a few years. Uh, on our trips at the times, people always, there was always cooking classes scheduled. I, I'd go to my room and work on my lectures. Uh, it's definitely the future. Um, this is my own culinary tourism when I was in the middle of the tsunami when I had not such a great meal. Uh, the, here is something I call tea tourism, amazing getaway. Go to a plantation and stay in one of the accommodations there. Uh, something I wrote about. But most importantly is spiritual tourism or pilgrimages, probably the original tourism for people of all faiths, Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, everyone of all faiths, uh, every believer. Millions of Muslims go to Mecca, Islam's holiest site, or Medina, the second holiest site, or to Jerusalem, um, the third holiest site, uh, which is, of course, holy to two other faiths. Christianity and Judaism. So the spiritual can get political quite easily. At the other extreme of spiritual tourism is sex tourism, which preys on the vulnerabilities of the poorest countries. And you can see from this map that uh, the source countries are Canada, America, Australia, Britain, China. And the destinations are, of course, Southeast Asia and India and Brazil. Then there's red tourism, where the Chinese retrace the roots of the long march and dress up like soldiers, uh, relive the exploits of Chairman Mao. Um, I've done one of the best red tourism outings. Uh, I don't expect you to dress up like a soldier, but you can, you can in Beijing go into the network of tunnels and bomb shelters that Mao built in his most paranoid moments when he was worried about a Soviet attack. This tunnel, I can tell you, is really off the beaten path uh, and highly recommended. There's political tourism, just like red tourism. I did take, don't like cruises, but I did take one to North Korea. Uh, to be with 800 South Koreans uh, going to the first time for the first time to uh, the hermit kingdom and being sort of fast a fast with North Koreans, uh, everybody looking at each other. Uh, they were kin, but foreigners to each other, I guess. And um, uh, you can also get a trip to North Korea. I went with the, our with our Canadian ambassador, but uh, these days I think it's harder to do. Okay. Um, there's also LGBT tourism. For example, the Pride Parade in Toronto is a huge draw uh, and an economic attraction for, for us and American visitors. Uh, the problem for gay and lesbian travelers, I should tell you, is that some destinations are no-go zones. And most of the Middle East uh, is still firmly in the closet. Um, the, so I always advised our LGBT travelers on my New York Times trips to be cautious in Egypt where police raids can happen all the time. You'll see here that, that uh, Canada is ranked number one in the world for gay tourism, or tied, uh, whereas Egypt is at the bottom at number 179, ahead of uh, Iran at 194. Uh, so the good news is that you actually don't have to leave home if you're interested in LGBT tourism because Toronto is ground zero. And finally, there is a new kind of tourism that is changing the world, and that is uh, Instagram tourism or selfie tourism. It's it's. We try to capture the world and transmit it through the interactivity of Instagram, sometimes instead of interacting with people face to face. Uh, we now have selfie hotspots that attract huge traffic jams on farmers fields, lavender fields, where people trample on the crops to try to replicate the same photo. There's even Instagram sites which show all the photos that look the same across Instagram, checking off boxes. Uh, look, on the other hand, it can be incredibly charming. It's a big thing in Iran and everywhere I've been. Um, so. That is my partial list of a few examples of how to get off the tourist escalator that keeps rising higher and higher. But as we've seen, segmentation is not sustainable in all settings because boutique tourism can be just as bad in terms of consumption or intrusion or unfairness. So let me show you a couple of other case studies, places that maintained a delicate equilibrium between cash flow from tourists and cultural sustainability that benefits everybody. I'm gonna talk about Bali for a minute because it's such a classic destination. So many foreigners converge on this tiny tropical island. It has suffered from terrorism. I had to cover a terrible bombing there years ago, but it bounced right back faster than other places because the terrorists had no local support and Balinese, Bali's indigenous culture was so strong. I've always believed it could be a model for other places that are threatened with assimilation and homogenization because the Balinese are trying to blend cultural and commercial tourism in a way that is self-sustaining. 
they, they are safeguarding their unique Hindu culture, which would otherwise fade away. And they use the prophets for preservation of their culture. Uh, dancers will hold cultural nights everywhere and the religious temples are bustling. So is tourism a preservative that makes things performative? Maybe, but what is the alternative? The problem, as I've said, is that cultural tourism can sometimes lead to cultural voyeurism and exploitation. And tourists like doctors have to remember to do no harm. And that's hard when tourism is a mass movement of 1.4 billion people. I think Egypt is a country that has tried to make the most of its history and cultural heritage without being corrupted by foreign influences. Now, I don't care much for cruises, but there is no better way to see the temples of Egypt than by boat. And I've led those trips and I've also gone on my own steam and I could keep going back because travel, that's my daughter running in one of the temples, travel along the Nile is the experience of a lifetime my other daughter on a cruise. It also keeps Egypt sinking, it keeps Egypt's sinking economy afloat financially and alive. There's a powerful synergy. There's also a dependency and vulnerability because whenever tourism, terrorism kills tourism, it deals a death blow to the economy. So it's a, it's a tricky circle. Now, tourism is dying in Egypt right now because of COVID, but Egypt was actually, interestingly, the birthplace of mass tourism in the 1800s, you could say, when Thomas Cook invented the concept of package tours for the British, who would get these all-inclusive trips to see the pyramids and then go down the Nile. These are the original posters. And it brought big money for Egypt and fabulous profits for Thomas Cook. And it gave new life to the antiquities. But Thomas Cook is now ancient history. It declared bankruptcy just a few years ago. Uh, and its fleet of planes and its flotilla of Nile steamers is not coming back even after COVID, because budget tourists started to create and curate their own packages, their own trips online without the middleman doing it for them. Now, the old Thomas Cook concept is bankrupt, but the modern cruise ship that it invented is running amok. These massive boats are exhibit A for over tourism because they invade foreign cities and they sometimes provoke local rebellions by the residents who feel overwhelmed. They are living proof that even the strongest cultures and cities can be overrun. Some of these boats have as many as 18 decks or stories, 18 stories, and they hold upwards of 6,000 passengers fed three meals a day, day after day. These are like floating cities, uh, factory tourism that docks in a small city and just disgorges itself uh, all at once. I've talked about how, how tourist sites are turning into foreign theme parks, but now the cruise ships are themselves floating theme parks operated by the same people who run Disneyland. Disney has an entire fleet of sheets, a fleet of, of ships that will take you onto the high seas to see foreign lands while you're watching the most familiar Disney shows on stage to make you feel right at home, like you never left home. Now Venice, you see on the slide, Venice and Dubrovnik and, and Dubrovnik in Croatia are two port cities that are drowning under the weight of cruise ships that jam their ports. They are ground zero for what we call zero dollar tourism because they bring a tourist invasion without investing in the local economy. All those tourists come in huge numbers of spend so little money. They don't stay in hotels. They don't get big meals in restaurants. They bring their own water bottles, leave them behind and then go home to or back to the ship to have supper, a sumptuous meal on board. Now, some of these port cities are responding by trying to meter the number of ships and tourists and rationing access to what economists will call a limited or scarce resource. So the Italian government has decided to ban massive cruise ships from navigating past St. Mark's Square, which you're looking at here. Imagine you're, you're in St. Mark's Square and wow, what is that monster behind beside you, this whale? So, uh, Venice gets about 30 million visitors a year, worth about $3 billion. So Venice has now imposed an entrance fees for visitors to pay for the upkeep of a very crowded Denmark square. Now, same thing in Croatia, where people have converged, as you may know, because that's where they shot Game of Thrones. Uh, so that is a story in, unto itself of life imitating art. Now, here's another quick case study in the time we have. Uh, Bhutan, as you may know, is a remote kingdom that has figured out how to profit from foreign tourism without selling out. Um, it is a tiny country next door to Tibet, bordering on Nepal, another uh, Himalayan kingdom, uh, Tibet being, of course, Buddhist. And Tibet, uh, um, 
uh, sorry, Bhutan uh, is trying to learn in its own Buddhist culture from the mistakes of Nepal. Nepal led in an unlimited number of backpackers who spend a very limited amount of money. Um, and so Bhutan has chosen a model of rationing the number of tourists and charging them a minimum fee of 250 US dollars a day collected by the government, which may sound like a lot, which is good. That, that scares people off. But it's actually not a lot of money, of course, because uh, I've done it, admittedly, on the Toronto Stars tab, but I would do it again on my own dime because it's worth it. Tourists are always looking for bargains, and so this fee acts as a barrier to bargain hunters, but it opens up doors for others because it keeps the numbers down. And Tibet, the Bhutanese practice what they preach in terms of Tibetan Buddhism, and it's, it is definitely worth seeing. One other quick study, quick case study, uh, is India. Uh, which is such an amazing country. It gets so few tourists, relatively speaking. I could show you a graph compared to China. Uh, I wrote about the cultural tourism in Rajasthan where you can visit one palace after another and, and see the Rajas, where the Rajas live. And some of, them, some of the Rajas are actually now hardworking hosts, uh, which I wrote about, wrote about uh, serving their guests a bit of a role reversal for the ruling classes. I could take us through more case studies, but the proverbial sun is setting on this journey and we're running out of time. But more case studies would just show that every country is a special case and they would leave us with the same result, which is that there's no stopping tourism. The question is, how do you make it more sustainable when it starts up again? And there's no single solution, but there are several strategies. I've walked you through a bit of a list of boutique tourism and alternative to homogenized tourism. Clearly, tourists have to pick their spots and countries have to pick their tourists or at least figure out how many to let in. Both sides need to be more strategic and more selective. Now, here's that chart which we have shown you of the rise of tourism from 400 million in 1990 to 1 1.4 billion pre-pandemic. The challenge is recognizing the rise of tourism and how to make it not go through the roof. Everyone listening to this talk wants to travel again, including you and me. If more and more middle-class people can afford to travel from countries like China, how do you dial down the numbers? Over the past year, time has stood still, travel stood still, but not for much longer. And wearing these masks has given us some breathing room, but as more people get vaccinated and catch their breath, we will all be out the door again. We have been traveling since the beginning of time, and that is not about to stop. Question is, we're, we're all gonna be back. The question is, how much will we do it? How much will it cost? And how many of us will be able to afford it? A uh, Couple of obvious solutions. Uh, we can smooth out peak season, you know, encouraging people to go off season. There's even a website that tells you when to go. It's called avoidcrowds.com. Problem is we've already tried that over the years, right? For centuries, we've had peak pricing in high season. It smooths things out, but it's the peak that is still causing so much congestion. So uh, we can use pricing as a way to ration access, which might sound elitist, but if you leave tourism as a free-for-all, you might spoil it for everybody. We saw this with Bhutan versus Nepal. We can redirect people into travel segments like boutique tourism. I told you about, you know, for lovers of food or people of faith, religious pilgrimages are perennial, whether it's to Mecca or Jerusalem, you know, in God we travel. Uh, we can try to limit the numbers by just metering the number of visitors and cruise ships. We can restrict access. That's what a lot of national parks do now in Canada, right? In museums in Europe, they ask you to book in advance online to keep the numbers that are con under control and avoid the long lineups that I still remember when I went to the Uffizi Museum in Florence. The, hour, the lineup went, lasted for hours. Uh, by the way, now in the pandemic, the Uffizi Museum has parceled out its collection of Botticelli's and Da Vinci's to 100 other venues and museums across Tuscany so that you can reduce the congestion in Florence. So the challenge is to give people a different destination that diverts them away from the main sites, away from Florence, send them to Siena instead, or avoid Barcelona and divert to Madrid. Maybe skip Egypt and go to Sudan where these photos were taken by the way, a nice image for me to wind down this journey as we prepare to lift off. It doesn't matter whether you are a slow traveler or a day tripper, a backpacker or a package tourist, you're just visiting and then you're going back home to your own world. It's not always a cultural exchange. Sometimes it's just an economic transaction with limited possibilities for human interaction. 
we need to think about it, not just from the perspective of the visitors, but also the venues. Because if you restrain over tourism, you can maybe save tourism for another day by making it sustainable so that it benefits the people who live and work there over the long term. The alternative is unrestrained tourism that displaces and disrupts the people who live there. As I said at the beginning, there will never be an end to tourism. Not even a pandemic can keep us grounded for long. It will keep coming back. The trick is to stop it from reaching a dead end, to make it better than the past, less destructive in the future, because we cannot just keep having more of the same, bigger and more massive than before. The point of this talk, of this thought experiment, is to make us rethink the problem. I don't have all the answers, as you can see, and neither does anyone else I've talked to along the way, not even the Lonely Planet people. We all have to come up with better answers. And on that note, I am keen to hear your questions. So thank you for listening to this journey. And now it's my turn to hear your thoughts. So Peter, back to you. And I just need to learn how to figure out how to make this PowerPoint Stop sharing. I mean, there we go. That's great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, deeply, deeply interesting. We've got lots of questions in the Q and A. There, there, there's two types of questions broadly. One is, how do we, uh, uh, how do we do the things you're talking about, which are to try to make mass tourism more sustainable? And the second type of questions are, I, I call them travel travel tips, uh, and they're they're pretty pretty reasonable actually all around. <laughs> Let me let me let me put a frame on what you've said, and I want to hear your response to it. Which is that what you've described is really the mass democratization of travel. That uh, whatever your income level, it was it's easier to travel now than it was 20 years ago, and it's certainly easier to travel now than it was than it was 50 years ago. So, what do we gain from this politically, uh, socially, culturally, and what would we lose if, if somehow we could just we could just stop half of trips? What would we lose? Another way of asking that is what have we lost over the last year when we've all been grounded here? Uh, and what's the what's the what's the what's the deficit that's been a result of this of this lack of travel? Great question. Uh, and and the best analogies I can think of are not a perfect analogy, but so-called democratization of universities, where we have allowed tremendous uh, increases in admission so that everybody can share in the benefits of a, of a post-secondary education, not just an elite. So trade-offs, but clear benefits. No question we have democratized travel. It's a great analogy. Uh, the analogy I would give though is to congestion charges in a city. If you're in London or Singapore or Toronto, everybody wants to come into the city. We just can't cope. And so we've come up with this idea of congestion charges, which we're too afraid to try in Toronto for various reasons but which have actually worked in London. So, you know, I majored in economics when I was at university and I think we just have to ration a scarce resource. And the way to do that was to make people more selective and countries more selective. Clearly, Air Canada cannot issue ration coupons to make it fair for everybody. So price will be part of it. And that's unfair for folks who can't afford it. And there are other uh, you know, middle income countries who won't put up with that. So there's, I don't have the magic solution for how you connect all those dots, but that's, that's the challenge we face. So, uh, so if you were an economist, if we're talking about this as economists, I guess the, I guess what you're saying is you put a price on it, and, and that inherently makes it elitist because then people who yeah. can afford it can get it. The other option is to do lotteries, of course, right? That we would, that we would, we would limit the number of people who can come in to see any anything in particular, and then we would say, you know, uh, enter enter your name into enter your name into a draw, and we actually do that for lots of for lots of public. Uh, access things. What do you know? Any place that's doing that? That's that that that, that is effectively using lotteries to uh, to allocate access to cultural sites or to or to travel destinations. I I don't because I think part of the objective for the recipient country is to achieve is to is to generate income. So it's more tempting to use price as as a as a rationing tool. But I will say that there's a famous or an interesting example in uh, in Portugal. I believe it's in Porto where there was a bookstore that everybody was converging on after uh, Harry Potter uh, because the author had had hung out there when she was writing the book. So it became one of these crazy, uh, much like Game of Thrones, uh, go to places. So it's just a bookstore and nobody was buying books. So they started charging a price of admission, a ticket, not a lottery. You could use a lottery, but they charged admission. People were happy to pay and they just still didn't buy books. They bought souvenirs but at least it was more symbiotic for the locals. 
Yeah. So I have one more question then for myself, and I want to turn to the questions that are in the, that are in the Q and A. But um, when we think about the environmental cost of travel, a big part of it is consumption, right? But you have to think about that consumption kind of like a marginal way. Like I'm going to eat three meals a day, irrespective of where I eat, right? So at the margin, I'm not adding that much on. But the big one is, as you say, is air travel. And air travel has become remarkably cheap. And you know, the old days of going to Europe when you were a student and buying a rail pass and slowly going from one country to another were at least partially displaced by EasyJet and Ryanair, where you could spend four bucks. And as long as you weren't wearing any clothes, you could get on the plane and then you could travel wherever you wanted to go. And you, know, you could keep doing that for a couple of weeks. So what's the what's the what's the kind of the legislative framework or what's the what's just the way we're going to we're going to deal with air travel because that really is the thing that's accelerating impact on the earth for from travel right and if, and if we could cut that in half we would cut the environmental impact of of travel to uh, you know by by 80 or something like that the jumbo jet uh, was the first to really change the the, the volumes and then and then discount airlines uh, which come and go have have obviously revolutionized that and Perhaps COVID will, will do us that favor of making air travel more expensive. I don't have a particular answer for how you, how you impose limits. What I appeal to in my idealistic and perhaps naive way is for people, for travelers, for the folks who are listening and want to try to help, that you can organize your travel differently. And so as you suggested, take the train in Europe uh, is, is, is making a comeback. But when you're going to Europe for that trip, right? Like I know so many people who would go to Paris or London, I don't know that many people, but they're folks with some disposable income who would go to London for a week or Paris for a week and come back and then go to London a few months later for a week. Well, I've tried to avoid that in my own personal life, not necessarily when I was a journalist on assignment, but I would go to Europe for three weeks at a time, almost always in my life. And so that way you're just cutting out that huge intercontinental trip. That's, that's probably my biggest ask for people is to not just do these Caribbean getaways for seven days, do it for three weeks and get it out of your system or, or, or find another way to, to see the world without jet setting quite so frequently. Or there's, there's some questions about how technology is changing travel. And I want you to ref, to reflect on this. So I, I happen to know that you are, you are, uh, uh, you, you were traveling in the 1980s, you were traveling in the 1990s and, and, and certainly the, the aughts and the 10th. So you, you were traveling while the internet was coming online and was really revolutionizing the way we got information. Can you just walk us through how you see technology having, you know, both technology for finding places and booking, but also things like translation abilities uh, online. How are these changing? How are these changing travel? How are they changing for the good? And how are they changing it for the ill? Well, if you set aside the problem of congestion, which is a tough one, it's a fantastic opening. It's a fantastic window. When I went abroad uh, as a foreign correspondent, the internet was just coming online. And so it, it opened up a connectivity that was unprecedented and unfathomable before. But certainly it extends to the, just the versatility and the, and the ease of access of not having to lug around <laughs> the old guidebooks. And I used, to, I used to cannibalize my guidebooks, which just seems heretical, but I would always pull out that chapter from the spine of the book when I was in a particular city rather than carrying 800 pages of Lonely Planet with me. Now you don't have to do that. You can just, you can just have it all downloaded on your, on your uh, uh, smartphone. But uh, this, this travel site that I mentioned, uh, whose name I now forget, but I think it's the one I mentioned in the speech, which tries to, to tell you using algorithms and various databases, when is the right time to go? I think that's actually helpful. I just don't think it'll solve the problem that, that uh, that pricing uh, will, will achieve for us. But I think there are a million ways to answer that question. I've never actually used translation, simultaneous translations. Um, I had tried to learn a couple of languages, um, Arabic and Chinese, uh, if I can show off. And then I would use translators because I never got past the small talk. So I was blessed by having interpreters and that opens such a window, I have to say. It's, it's, it's having the language barrier dismantled is revolutionary, but that's the beauty of places like India. If I can just make a plug for India, uh, it is a place where you you don't need anything other than English. It's also one of the great one of the great privileges of being in a country where the lingua franca is English. That, that oh, yes. you can we can travel around the world and and uh, and can converse with comparative ease and just it's just by yeah. lottery of lottery. Of and, and let me just add that that has yeah. changed. I mean, I speak French. When I went to Lebanon, I thought I'd be using my French, and while they speak the most amazing show off French in Beirut, uh, it, it is astonishing. 
uh, especially in the Middle East, by the way, I got spoiled in the Middle East where English really is almost like India, a second language, uh, not so much in Italy, but now even in Italy and France, we've all seen how that's changed. Let me ask you about, because about, uh, there are questions about this, about sort of the, the, the trade-off between uh, security and adventure. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think I'm not the only one to see to my questions who's interested in, in, under, in thinking about this from a family, from a family perspective. Just what are your, what are the insights and the practices you've gained over time about how you uh, balance off that, that practice of actually really getting off the beaten path and, and, and maybe not always putting yourself in the safest situations as opposed to, you know, choosing travel options, which are very, uh, which are very safe and, and circumscribed and, uh, uh, and well-defined. That's a great question. I'll try not to, I'll try to set aside my journalist hat. I already bored you with those trade-offs that I made and talk about it from a tourism point of view. When I lived in Jerusalem for four years, it was astonishing to me and, and depressing to me how many good friends, I don't, I think it wasn't personal. I think they actually did want to see me. were just terrified. Family were terrified of coming to see us because of the bus bombings in Jerusalem and the other suicide attacks. And I have to remind people that these attacks were happening, not in Canada much, but they were happening in other parts of the world. They just weren't covered in the same way because Jerusalem has more foreign correspondents per square meter than any place on earth, perhaps outside of Washington. So the media, which I love because it's my, it's my livelihood, uh, tends to sometimes exaggerate danger. And that was kind of the, the point of showing you those hotel slides. Yeah, they sound like dangerous places, but but remember that Toronto can be a dangerous place, and yet we both know it isn't actually a dangerous place when you look at it mathematically. You know, you can there's far greater risk of being killed in a road accident in Israel, where everyone every driver thinks they are an F-18 fighter pilot, than by getting killed by a terrorist bomb. So remember, in European capitals, they get a lot of bombing. In American cities, they get them a lot too, or other kinds of shootouts. So. Uh, look, and some of the times I went to places, uh, as I said, I, I was younger and dumber and didn't have kids. And I, I did have a secret and it lapsed into journalism for a moment in that I always went when it sounded dangerous, but wasn't because it was before or after the real, uh, the real flashpoint. So I think tourists need to just not be governed by these government warnings and insurance, travel insurance hyperbole. Uh, I mean, no, you shouldn't go into Afghanistan right now. You shouldn't go hiking in Iraq, but you could certainly go to Israel right now, to Jordan, to Egypt, other than COVID. And, and, and my, my, my bottom line is that the Middle East is the most misunderstood in terms of the real risk factor versus other geopolitical distractions. Yeah, having taken a taxi from a Tel Aviv airport to Jerusalem many times in my life, it's a, it's a, it's a harrowing experience. <laughs> uh, drive, driving is relatively aggressive on Israel highways. Um, what do you see? There's lots of questions about, I think as people have, maybe have trips booked, but also just because they're interested in the question. What do you see the next six months looking like and the next and the next 12 months looking like? I have this sense that there is just this, just this, and I think we see it the questions, just a, a pent up demand that is it's like a it's like a valve that's ready to blow, a pressure release valve because people have really been really been stuck together. So let me ask you that question. And then let me ask you an, another question. Uh, you could give us answer to both, which is that if we wanted to be tourists in our own country uh, this summer, you know, even given the restrictions we have, what would you recommend people do? Yeah, and, and that's the logical cor cor corollary. Um, I think the, the uh, uh, clearly I don't have a crystal ball because I was thinking about a trip to India sadly this fall and I now don't think that's likely to happen. Um, so so the, the, uh, it's a changing scene outside of North America. The answer from talking in fact uh, for some of my friends in the travel business that I have gotten to know over the last few years, they are experiencing a, an explosion, uh, the pent up demand that you're referring to in domestic travel. And some of these operators specialize in giving their expertise much like fixers to foreign remote lands, putting together trips to Iran and Lebanon that people might not quite know what to do. That business, that business is dead for now. Uh, Europe is still happening, obviously. And so the Europe destination will, will come back to life. But the more remote destinations that I like to entice people with are, are, are off the map, not just because 
they are still going to be, there are low income countries that will have low vaccination rates and perhaps high variants. But secondly, the, the health facilities, the hospital facilities are, are, are not going to be trusted by people. And that's understandable, even though there's great, you know, some destinations like Pakistan have fantastic medical tourism, Thailand, medical tourism, people are going to be scared of going there. The corollary, as you say, is that everyone's, that, that pent up demand is being expressed in domestic tourism. And I think you'll see it with European tourism in the next couple of months. It's already happening. If you, you know, I like talking about vaccination passports. I'm a believer in them. I get a lot of hate mail from readers about it, but I think vaccination passports are going to be the ticket, so to speak, to get into Europe. They, they already are, literally. And, so and I me, didn't answer your question. About, I yes. think your, 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 your fault was where to go domestically. I don't have any bright ideas beside the Rockies and Eastern Quebec and the Maritimes that we were just talking about, uh, but there's lots of opportunities in Canada. So let me ask you one question to, to wrap up with, which is you, you've been to many places, but uh, can you tell us, are there, are there three countries you haven't been to that you'd like to go see and why? What is it about you as, a, as, a, as, a, as an inveterate traveler, as a journalist, as a, as a thinker that, that draws you to those places you haven't yet been to? Interesting. Um, there's not a lot. Uh, I, I've been to, I, I never really counted, but I'm, I think it's at about 45 countries, thanks to the blessing of, of being a foreign correspondent. Um, I have, uh, I've, I've not seen enough of Lat Latin America. I've, I've been to Ecuador, or not Ecuador, but uh, Bolivia and Peru. And, and uh, I, I, I have never been to Russia. I have been to the old Soviet Union. I've been to Ukraine. Um, which is a which is a fantastic um, destination, Poland as well, Romania, and and I love Eastern Europe. But the places I haven't been to, Russia would be the one, and and anywhere in in South America. I've seen all of Asia, and Asia is a is a fascinating but difficult destination uh, because uh, the six, the big cities of Asia are uh, you need to have that zoom lens that I was talking about. They're not curated. And, and preserved uh, uh, the way that some European cities are, but the rougher edges are what makes Asia sometimes so interesting. Martin, I know this is gonna turn itself into a book, or at least I hope that it, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I hope that it is and surely it should. Um, yeah, I think you've given us a very interesting insight on, on really three things from my perspective. One is you know, the big picture of global travel, uh, the, the, the really zoomed in picture of your own travel and your own interest, which has been which has been really interesting. But I think the most important one is this has been very reflective, I think, for us to think about when we have this chance to travel in the future, how we want to do it in a way that's respectful of the planet and others, but also hopefully can continue to scratch that itch to get out and uh, and see the world. I think you hint that it might be something that's deep inside of us, and I'm pretty convinced that it is. So it's been wonderful having you with us. Thanks so much for sharing your experience. And your, these, not only the wonderful photographs, but the, the lifetime stories that go behind them. And thanks so much for being a fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, stay safe, stay sane, and uh, safe travels. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Good afternoon. Bye for now.